Thank you so much, Lori. Um, folks who've been uh, getting logged on earlier know that we've been doing a little bit of talking about Reader's Advisory. This is Reader's Advisory for everyone, so welcome. So what we're going to talk about today is really framing that conversation, understanding that Reader's Advisory certainly is much more than just face-to-face -face interaction, and also not only thinking about that, but just talking a little bit about um, providing sort of a framework so that we can all start thinking about where our services are currently and doing a little bit of an assessment and then thinking also about and hopefully sharing a lot of ideas for strategies to definitely move services to the next level. And then also some strategies for really taking advantage of staff's talent and capacities and building on that. So we're going to hear from, from, from folks on the panel today who are really working to improve their reader's advisory through a little bit slightly different approaches. So first, let me introduce Tammy Clausen. Tammy's worked in public libraries for more than 20 years, and that began at Berwyn Public, where she led a reader's advisory department, and then she both supported and nurtured the library's reader's advisory services as the director. But most recently, Tammy's been the branch manager at the James LaRue Library at Highlands Ranch in Colorado, and that's with Douglas County. And she's very committed, she said, to transforming her library as a collaborative and committed institution that excites, excites the expectations of its users. She's also the co-author of the Horror Reader's Advisory, Librarian's Guide to Vampires, Killer Tomatoes, and Haunted Houses. So joining her will be Tom West, and those of you who are here for the warm-up know already that Tom spent more than 20 years in book selling and publishing. He worked for two national retail chains and two independent bookstores, both in Minnesota and Vermont, and a small publisher before coming to the library world to work for Brazoria County Library System as a branch manager. And he's been the adult coordinator there since 2008. So Tom will be sharing information on how they move toward working with staff at the branch level. And then Duncan Smith, of course, is the general manager and founding partner of Novelist. He was inspired to develop the Novelist Reader's Advisory Database based on research he conducted on why readers read what they read. He's passionate about the power of libraries and Reader's Advisory to transform lives. He's the author of the article, Books, an Essential Part of Essential Libraries, published in Public Library Quarterly. And so Duncan will frame that conversation about empowering different kinds of staff to help different kinds of readers. So that's a lot to start. We have a lot going on today. So we will begin with Tammy. She'll share how Douglas County assessed their already robust readers' advisory services to consider how to expand that. So Tammy. Well, hello. Um, as Kathy said, my name is Tammy Clausen. And um, Douglas County Libraries has a seven branches, uh, and the county is located just south of Denver. Um, uh, one of the, the most important things that has happened in the county uh, is they're, the, they're just experiencing, or we are, we're experiencing tremendous growth. So in the time from 2000 to 2010, uh, the population increased 62%, and we're seeing in the next uh, 15, 20 years uh, even about the same kind of growth. So uh, lots of uh, population kind of explosion here in Colorado. Um, if we were, uh, I think, anytime we're looking at implementing or expanding a service, um, we need to look at who our residents are and see if it's the right fit for our residents. So I have this uh, screen here that's a, a quick little look at a typical adult resident of uh, Douglas County. And the takeaways or the highlights are that um, these residents are technically uh, savvy and super connected with uh, about 95% of our residents having internet at home and carrying um, a smartphone. Then the next slide, uh, this one, uh, is, gives a quick little summary of some of the trends that we are seeing in the last uh, year. Um, and the highlights are that um, we have high CERC, uh, we're well used, we have well used co uh, collections, and our patrons are big users of digital collections. So when we were looking at um, whether, uh, you know, RA was um, where we would fit into our new strategic plan, 
you're one ahead, one back. Can we go back one slide? There we go. So we were looking where it fit into our strategic plan. We had a new strategic plan put in place in January, and uh, we have three goals. And the second goal is Design My Library, a premium personal library experience, um, is where this, oh, this fits. Um, so the first thing we uh, were looking at is designing the right suite of uh, RA services uh, that offer the right experiences for the right customers. Uh, the second uh, was that we have a district um, that uh, has a lot of uh, different departments and we wanted to make sure the entire organization was uh, focused on it with cross-departmental collaboration. So um, we have a acquisition department, a centralized training department, and our social media and web uh, maintenance comes out of our marketing department. So that when we were looking at uh, our, our, the next slide, we got the next slide here. Yeah, that we were looking at our organizational identity. Our library director, Bob Pazniak, posed a, kind of a David Letterman top 10 list of questions uh, just before PLA. And two of the questions from that list um, are relevant to RA services. Um, they're philosophical questions about our um, organizational identity. And th here they are. Uh, what's more effective, a centralized effort to meet aligned goals or a practitioner's freedom? And the second one was, should we work at the classic library brand or should we be looking for a creative uh, alternative? As the district kind of grapples with these organizational directions and priorities and identity, RA is popping up to the top as a service that uh, we feel we can really excel and could set us apart. Uh, we are asking ourselves if uh, doing RA exceptionally well would resonate with our residents, and uh, can we be just can we be about reading? Uh, can we make it feel new and cutting edge? Uh, with such a very classic library service. Um, so when we're talking about, on the next slide, we're uh, looking at uh, our organization, how we expand Reader's Advisory Focus, we are looking at some pretty big uh, cultural shifts here in the district. And uh, the two that I want to uh, highlight are the librarian role as a content creator, um, Rather than uh, a gatherer of resources, uh, we do a lot of those bibliographies as a gatherer, and we're looking at uh, what it means to be a blogger and uh, a content creator. The second is uh, to develop RA specialists. We spent uh, about a decade or more training our staff to be generalists that can flex between different departments and work different desks. Uh, is equally well, and so we um, are looking at identifying those that have specific expertise and then training up. So when we were looking at designing, uh, on the next slide, we we're looking at designing a suite of services. Here's one, the one that we, we came up with. It looks very similar to what um, most libraries, uh, or a combination of things that most libraries do. These are ours specifically. And um, I think it's really important to, to really identify all those pieces within your RA, um, under your RA um, umbrella so that they kind of are, are packaged together. Uh, we're finding that uh, be very uh, effective. And the next slide, we have um, the things that we do um, very well. Uh, these are the things that we have kind of uh, created um, a, a certain amount of competency with, uh, with our fo uh, formal uh, training and um, our training up and down, our face-to-face -face, uh, RA is, is um, pretty robust. Uh, we have great collections. We buy multiple copies. We have uh, a very um, timely, popular collection library uh, co um, at each of the branches. And then uh, we have a, a in-house marketing department that create book lists, um, uh, uh, bookmarks, uh, posters, all those pieces. We don't do a lot of flyers because we don't do a lot in paper. Um, so much of our 
uh, marketing pieces are electronic. And then our displays, we have created criteria for our displays. Um, we've been very successful in having our displays um, really push circulation. Um, and uh, we uh, spend a lot of time making sure they're stocked and, and timely. And then we spend, um, uh, have gotten pretty good at our book events. We have big, um, big author events off-site, uh, like Diane Gabaldon was here last year. And then we do, uh, almost on a monthly basis, a library uh, or author visits that have, uh, you know, uh, that bring in about 100 to 300 people um, at, at, the, at the branches themselves. We also have a book lovers program, uh, which is uh, just a, a book talking piece that we do at each of the branches on, on a regular basis. The things that we're looking at uh, our areas of growth are, um, are on the next slide, and we're really looking at that digital RA. We have a new uh, website in a discovery layer um, going to be unveiled in October, and we're really putting a lot of energy in making sure that RA presence is dynamic, um, is, um, really does what we want it to do. And then um, we are also really growing our social media. Our Facebook is, is very effective. Our Pinterest, Instagram blogs are, are a little less so. And so a lot of our, our future um, uh, focus will be on some of those um, different social media. Great. And that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Tammy. So Tom, tell us more about um, doing Reader's Advisory from a branch perspective. From a branch perspective, well, <laughs> <laughs> of course I can since I was a branch manager as well. Um, well, Brazoria County, we are in Texas. We are just south of Houston, uh, west of Galveston, and we cover um, from suburban Houston all the way down to the oil refineries on the Gulf Coast. So we're a pretty big county with 12 branches. Uh, two of the branches in our largest city uh, account for 46% of our circulation. Basically, it's suburban Houston, and that is growing further and further south. So we're also experiencing big growth. And um, so far this year, our e-circulation is up 30% over last year. So that's another uh, reason why we have been pushing for reader's advisory via social media. So we do a lot with, with other branch with other libraries, the same thing that, um, that um, like Tammy mentioned too, we do the book talks, like what's new in books. Uh, you can see that on the next slide. Um, and then um, just with brief destruction, you know, and resources that we can use, um, uh, I push that out to all the branches and, and staff to let them know. But Reader's Advisory, of course, is comes in many forms, and as I, as um, Tammy's mentioned too, there's all kinds of things. But the thing that really struck me was, you know, we have all these beautiful flyers and posters that we post around the buildings, but what about the people who don't come into the buildings? We have to reach them as well. And, right, and now, of course, we just instituted, you know, um, automatic renewal. So, I mean, it could be a month before the people come back. What about those beautiful displays and things? Well, we have really um, pushed it onto the branches to participate much more actively in social media. So when they create their flyers, they post them um, on Facebook, they um, send them out as tweets. We also have um, a Pinterest Reader's Advisory Board. Uh, we've instituted Instagram as well, so we can do that. But getting the word out and to where the people are, and a lot of times they're not in your building. They are on their devices checking in to see what's new. So getting the word out that way. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, some, it's like I do little talks, but of course talks are wonderful, but only so many people can come to a talk. Uh, and that was one of the issues we had too, you know, it's like, yes, um, people can't always make it to them. So. We have moved on to, like I said, the social media. But what I found really exciting was when we did first approach the branches, and they all had their own Facebook pages, but we, um, when I went to them and said, listen, you have to reach the people that aren't in your building. So if a great book comes in, do a little display, snap a picture, post it on your Facebook page. I mean, every little bit helps. And if you're enthusiastic and have some visual art, you know, visual stuff to go with it. It just makes it so much more appealing to the people who can't be in your building. They see this things come in and they see 
someone on the staff recommending it, and they have a um, identification with that person, and they can, you know, become your followers. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to become the followers on on social media. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see again all the things. And basically, social media is one on one. It's just another way of reaching the patrons. And you know, they have all these wonderful tools: the uh, the read alikes the book maps. I mean, we just, if you already created it, you might as well post it on any means necessary to get the word out. Go to the next slide. Uh, again, we do um, both in-house, online. We also post them around town. I know I'm, I like to take my laundry and drop it off because I don't have time to do it, but I go to the laundromat, I drop off a flyer, and I probably post it on their bulletin board, things like that, just getting the message out to places where people wouldn't normally think to see a reader's advisory. Um, the next slide, again, I love Pinterest. I'm on Pinterest all the time, and, and I'm always finding book lists and things like that personally. So we, we created a, a Pinterest board um, for reader's advisory, and it's so easy to do. What um, So it's mainly me and the reference librarians and the other key staff who are the um, um, movers and shakers of the reader's advisory in our county. So we, um, we posted this board, and we share this with um, with our staff, and of course, we always invite patrons to come in and follow us too. But again, I mean, I know we have patrons that are on Pinterest a lot, and they probably should be reading books. But this way, we can get them that way too, and get to find them lists of books to get into their hands. And posting direct to social media—that was a major thing for us. Uh, it was a lot of debate. Uh, I really was an advocate for the branches to post direct, and they all feed into our county account, so I do see everything that's posted. Uh, initially, I had, they had to run everything by me. That was just too much for 12 branches, so um, they do have, um, they can just run it by their branch managers before they post, and then um, it's, been, it's been really nice, and I have been amazed at, at some of the um, frontline staff that have really stepped forward and, and really blossomed under this new freedom. It's like, you know, what, what, you mean I can actually recommend books on the, on our branch Facebook page? I said, yes, you can. Uh, and that's the whole point is like, you know, everybody has, has these abilities and tools and you just have to, to nurture what your staff has to offer. And I mean, you'd be amazed at some of the talent that's out there and creativity, just even doing book displays and taking the pictures and getting them out there and just writing little, you know, brief little synopsis of why they like the book and, and why you should come in and check it out. And the next one, we, uh, one of our reference librarians came up with this um, wonderful thing. It's a book butler and, and we've cobbled it together from other libraries that do the same thing. But this is for the people who want a little bit more personalized um, attention and they, you know, they can't come in and meet us in person. And um, this has been surprisingly popular. We just introduced it a few months ago and the response has been very, very good. Uh, what we've done is we um, we use myself and the reference librarians as, again, the core group, but we did send out a, a survey to all our, our staff and said, do you have any special interests that uh, you are particularly expert in or that you would feel comfortable uh, recommending books in? So we, we compiled the little list um, that we have of our our staff, and there's an amazing amount of talent on our staff that, and the wide diversity of things that they read, you know. Um, so just tapping into that, and that makes them feel really a part of the team, um, the Reader's Advisory team, too. It's like they get called on to, to give a recommendation. And it, um, it doesn't take too much time of our staff. I mean, it, we're not swamped with hundreds of requests, but we do get them in you know, every few days or so. So uh, it is really nice to be able to, um, to call on the wide-ranging um, resources available, both um, through the tools that we have and just the personal knowledge of all the people that we have employed in our library system. So that is about it for me, and here is my contact information because I'm sure we're going to get questions. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. so Duncan will talk about empowerment, both empowerment of staff and of empowering readers as well. 
Thank you, Kathy. Um, what you've just heard this, this afternoon are two great examples of Tammy talking about Douglas County and Tom talking about Brazoria, about how they have thought through Readers Advisory Services and the needs of their community and the talents of their staff and gotten everybody involved in moving forward uh, their Readers Advisory Services. Uh, one of the things we learned about you as participants um, is that about 39% of you or say, have stated that over the next 12 months, you're going to be thinking about ways of improving Reader's Advisory Services in your communities. And so what I'm going to do is pretty quickly work through a framework that, you, that might be helpful as you think about how do you identify staff talents and capacities and how do you match those talents to reader needs. Um, one of the things we need to understand is that um, Reader's Advisory Services take a, takes place in a context, and that context is something that we call the reading landscape. Uh, that landscape has three components, discovery, discernment, and delivery. Um, I'm going to give you an example of how that works for me personally. I get off a plane in Houston and I turn on my cell phone and a friend has texted me that Ann Leckie's new book, Ancillary Mercy, is out. Well, that's discovery because I didn't know that she was had a new book that was coming out. Um, discernment, because it's the third book in a series that I'm already enjoying. I didn't have to do a lot of work there, so I just went straight to delivery. And what delivery meant was when I got to my hotel room, I hopped on my laptop and place the book on hold at my local library. So that's the landscape that we're operating in, but let's take a look at some of the components of that landscape and how the library traditionally has been viewed as adding value. If you think about it, uh, in the example that I just gave, the library's value to me was really as a delivery service, a place where I go to pick up the book. Uh, I discovered it through a friend. I would already discerned because of previous experience that I wanted it. And so what I basically did is put a book on hold at the library and go in and pick it up. I'm sure in your experience that you have many patrons who do the same thing. But what we want to talk about is today is how we can use staff talent and match that talent to readers' needs to create a more balanced value proposition for you and your communities, balancing positioning the library not only to be a delivery service, but a place where people discover books and figure out which books are right for them. When we start doing that, we have to think about staff. And when we think about staff, uh, we think about them on, in really two dimensions here. And what was interesting to me is um, one of the things that we got from you um, is basically 24 pages of comments and statements about your needs and challenges when you start thinking about Reader's Advisory Services uh, in your libraries. And we can group those comments into, when we think about staff into a couple of broad areas. How much book knowledge do you have? Do you have high book knowledge or low book knowledge? And there, was a lot, there were a lot of you who talked about the comfort level of your staff, whether you have staff who are really comfortable doing Reader's Advisory Services or whether they're uncomfortable. Each and every one of these staff types have needs and have um, talents and skills to bring to your uh, Reader's Advisory Services. So if you look at that upper uh, right-hand corner where it says tools to share their knowledge, these are your Nancy Pearls. They're real comfortable with Reader's Advisory and they have high book knowledge. You want resources, uh, you want them to be doing things like developing bookmarks, developing book lists, working on uh, your, your electronic electronic newsletters, all of those things. You want to take their knowledge and make sure that it's not only used in face-to-face -face interactions but generalized through the system. Many of you talked about the fact that you're uncomfortable in doing reader's advisory when you haven't read the book or you don't personally know the genre very well. What these staff members need are tools that enhance their book knowledge and expand their, allows them to use their search and reference skills to respond to readers' advisory questions. Finally, in that bottom left-hand corner, that's those staff members with high book knowledge, but they're uncomfortable with um, 
uh, RA or they're uncomfortable in high pressure public service situations, all those people who were uh, discussed in the book Quiet, uh, I think that's a, a, a who we're talking about here. I'm just thinking about all those folks um, that Tom was talking about who, whose um, book knowledge got freed up to create posters and brochures, not only for in-library posting, but to post out to um, social media as well. And then finally, folks with low book knowledge and who are not comfortable in having book-oriented conversations, what you want to do here is you want to work very carefully with these people and make sure that you have a very structured approach so that they understand exactly um, who they should be referring to or what resources they should be consulting when they get book-oriented questions. Staff is half the equation, the other half are readers. And when we think about readers, we think about how much time they have to give to the library, lots of time to spend in the library or no time to spend in the library, and then what kind of relationship or interaction do they want with us and the library? Do they want a high-touch response or a low-touch low touch response? So when we look at those high-touch, lots of times reader, lots of time readers, you know these folks. They're the ones who are hanging out at the circulation desk, all always engaging you in conversation. They're the people who are coming to your, um, your book clubs and who are also coming to your author events that, you know, uh, Tammy mentioned earlier. Um, these are really high value customers. Over there in the next quadrant, that high touch, no time group, quite frankly, that's the group I'm in. I want to be connected and have a relationship with my library, but my interaction with the library tends to be finding out of books, finding out about books that I'm interested in from a variety of sources and a variety of people, and then checking to see whether the library has it or not. Um, and so we need a different kind of service to speak to those readers. Readers with lots of time and low touch, these are the people that, you know, you see these people but you don't know them because they don't talk to you a lot. But these are the folks who are using those, um, those book displays, those shelf talkers, and are browsing in your stacks. And I've been very interested in watching all of the ideas that are coming up in chat about book displays and bookmarks. Uh, those are really great ideas. Um, to go back up to that top uh, left-hand corner again, those high-touch, lots of time readers, these are the folks who get one-on-one -on -one help, who come to your events and programs. Again, high touch but no time. Make sure your catalogs are enriched with reader's advisory content and that you have uh, e-newsletters and are active in social media. Finally, you know, at the bottom here, no time and low touch. Um, these are individuals that are situational users. They may not even define themselves as readers. They tend to be people who come in because there's a school assignment, a health issue, or they need a job, or they're planning a trip. Uh, next slide. So when you start to think about your reader's advisory services, what I would suggest that you do is you think about your staff and you take 100 points and assign those 100 points across these four quadrants. Are 50% of your uh, staff, I'm so, sorry, readers here, uh, not yeah, staff, uh, are 50% of your staff member Nancy Pearls, which means they would be in that upper left-hand corner? Uh, are 20% of your staff members people who are very comfortable in having conversations and interacting with patrons but low book knowledge? That would be in the upper uh, right-hand corner. And just do the same for the other two quadrants that you have here. Um, next slide. When you think about readers, then you should think about the same thing. Take 100 points. How many of your readers are high touch lots of time? Is that 10%, 20%, 30%? And just do the same through the rest of those quadrants there. And then once you have done these two, quad, these two grids, you know something about your staff talents and capabilities and you know something about your readers' needs. Then go through this list of potential services that you could offer and just figure out what you're already doing and what you're doing well, 
what new things you might be thinking about doing or should be thinking about doing based on your staff's expertise or your reader needs, and then looking at things that you uh, might consider for the future but that not that are not on your radar right now. And when you sort of do this, basically what you've done is you've developed your own prescription for effective and better reader's advisory services in your community. Next slide. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Duncan. So there's a screen that flashed um, with folks' contact information, and we'll definitely make that available. And I just want to re repeat three really great phrases that I heard. One was from Tom, nurture what your staff has to offer. From Tammy, create a reading culture, um, and she used the phrase roving librarian and also the phrase book pusher. And Duncan mentioned matching readers' needs with the needs and talents of staff members. So thank you for those great um, suggestions and points. And I had a couple specific questions, and I think there were a couple from um, question and answer from, from the audience. But for you, Tammy, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, some of those practical considerations that come into play when you're talking about, you know, assessment and providing readers advisory service. You'd mentioned before when we talked um, initially about um, things like staff schedules. How have those kind of considerations about staffing informed RA services and what you, what you all have done in terms of um, ongoing work after your assessment? Uh, well, um, Part, part of it is we were put together a new scheduling model. So what we were able to do is instead of uh, uh, having people, so say uh, a librarian worked Wednesday night, and that was the night that we had the book discussion, uh, or ate one of the book discussions. That person became the person who ran the book discussion. So what we were able to do with a new scheduling model is match um, the right person to run that book discussion, so the, that the um, staff member had the, the interest, the passion, um, and really the time and capacity to really do that very well. So with, an, you know, with a new piece like that, we were able to uh, let our services um, uh, be directed not by the schedule, but by um, what we really wanted to see happen in, uh, in our libraries. The second was uh, that personal goal, that assessment piece. We did attach personal goals to um, a good portion of our public service staff that has an RA personal goal. So it's not, um, not that everybody does RA, um, there's, and everybody does do RA in our branches, but there is a group of people that that is their personal goal. Uh, to enhance this, uh, this uh, one piece of our services. Great, thank you. And Tom, I've got a question for you. I think um, it's an interesting thing that you all are doing in terms of creating branch identity um, mm -hmm. and allowing some social media posting. I've had a couple questions from the audience about that, um, which you uh -huh. addressed some of those. But um, also want to know how you got staff buy-in. I think some of the registration responses that we got indicated that folks really are juggling working with a variety of full-time, part-time staff, sometimes volunteers. I know it can right. be a challenge. So <laughs> yeah. how, how do you handle that? Is it kind of like a coaching kind of thing when you, with regard to working with staff? Yeah, it's like a coaching or mentoring kind of thing. What we what we've done is you know because some. Sometimes the branch manager is not the person who wants to be involved. They want someone younger and hipper to be <laughs> to be involved in the social media aspect. But what we but what I've done is I've worked with um, the branches uh, to identify staff members, and sometimes they're just clerks, and in a couple cases they're even shelvers. And but they have the talent and the passion, and we can have them um, you know go in and uh, create flyers or bookmarks and. And things like that, we can all and you know post them to social media, and if if someone comes up with a great idea, we share that with the other branches as well. And sometimes we even incorporate them system wide uh, for all branches to use. Because again, we're about 
uh, sharing. This is a team effort, and you know, if somebody can do it better and make it look prettier, let's go with that one. But we certainly um, encourage them to be as creative as um, as possible, and uh, that's where I have seen a, um, some real. Um, Blossoming. It's like you know, like wallflowers turn suddenly you know turn into you know blossoms and really shine when they're given the opportunity. And um, again, just unleashing that passion because they want to share. They want to talk about books. They want to share um, all these great ideas. And but yeah, working with the branch staff. I mean, I, I love going out to the branches and um, encouraging them. You know. I'm here to support you, not to hinder you. You know, that's you know been my goal. Thank you. I think mm -hmm. um, one other question for both of you, and maybe starting with you, Tammy. How do you all establish a consistency of readers' advisory service across branches? I think you touched on it both briefly, but I just wanted, if you don't mind, um, both of you, Tammy, first addressing that again. I think we're still working on on a piece of that uh, that consistency. Um, I do think uh, when we worked on this task force, this RA task force, some of the libraries felt more comfortable than others. They, when we took the assessment of where we were with RA services, there was a little bit of a difference of opinion about what our, you know, where our real strengths were. So um, I do think that is one of those pieces, uh, you know, that I mentioned that question that the the director had asked us uh, about. Um, um, do we um, are we more effective as uh, aligned aligning our goals districtly or or giving our our library staff freedom to create those those things um, kind of in how you know um, without that big alignment but I do think for us that alignment is very important um, so we the way we do that is that central um, Training piece. Every every new employee starting from at least the same spot, um, and then I think uh, as uh, staff uh, rotate through the different branches, uh, you know, they're they're taking ideas back and forth, and we're getting some best practices on how to do RA the most effective uh, that we can. How about for you, Scott? Question? <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> And for us in, in Brazoria County, we um, we pulled together, uh, created a marketing committee, which is made up of both senior and senior staff and um, branch level staff. And again, some of them are just clerks, and we um, not just clerks; they're very important. <laughs> so, but but we include a wide range of people, and we created a marketing calendar. So, like every month, we're doing a focus on um, uh, an awareness of some topic or a database. Things like that, and then in, and so that's for system-wide stuff. And then there, are, um, um, there's city events and regional events throughout the county that we participate in. And then, amongst all that, we encourage the branches to um, to come up with their own things as well um, to address the needs of of the populations that they serve. So, I mean, we do have the over, you know, the overarching plan, uh, which is, you know, from above, and then, but we encourage them to come up from from below too, so we kind of meet halfway. Great. So let's circle back to that that whole notion of comfort level and clerks and full time oh, right. and part time staff and volunteers yeah. and mm -hmm. just the notion that I know um, in some of the responses that we got from everybody, we know that folks um, there's a really varying degree of comfort level, and Duncan alluded to this as well, of folks who aren't comfortable with RA. So um, that stems from both um, their job role and definition, and then also just um, that feeling that they need to have read a book in order to really help somebody with it. And we talked about this a little bit in our pre-webinar warm-up, but anybody want to take a stab at that question about um, how, do we, how do we get everybody who we want um, involved with Reader's Advisory feeling a little more comfortable with that? Um. For, for Douglas County, uh, some of our strongest um, uh, RA uh, staff are, are from our paraprofessional um, ranks. Uh, so we we really, if they're if somebody's working the desk, we, we find that most people don't. They just assume everybody's um, you know a librarian. So much of the expectation when it comes to RA is very similar. 
Uh, and when we talked about those personal goals, or I talked about those personal goals, uh, uh, the uh, we call them um, public service technicians. Um, they also um, have a, an RA. Um, uh, personal goal, or many of them do, the identified people. So um, when we're talking about, uh, you know, ongoing, um, you know, or even um, training, training up, sometimes that comes from, um, you know, our paraprofessional staff. Uh, if we kind of don't have a, a real distinction. But a, a lot of our librarians are the full-time uh, staff. They have a little more time for the cre uh, content creation and those kind of things. So uh, the blogging and some of those other pieces often comes from that that group of staff. Thank yes, you. How uh, about you, Tom? Uh, yes, and then of course we have a lot of tools available. Um, you know, whether it's Novelist or um, Goodreads. I know a lot of of our staff. Um, I can use Goodreads or what should I read next. There are a lot of online tools that you can find um, for, to give you recommendations and if you're, if you're not familiar with a subject or an author. So to tap into that and then plus we have, you know, we can, you know, constantly emailing your, your coworkers and the other branches and, and getting support that way. You know, we're not leaving them out floundering in the wilderness there. They, can, they have uh, other team members that they can rely on as well. So just letting them know that and reinforcing that, you know, it's not a failure on your part that you yourself couldn't come up with a recommendation, you know, put the, the mind work of the whole team together and we can come up with something. Well, and, and um, Tom and Tammy, I just want to add, I've been watching the, the chat go by and there was a section there, uh, this is Duncan, where they were talking, where, where participants were talking about what questions do you, um, uh, do you use uh, when you're talking with a reader about what book they might want to read next? And a lot of people were saying things like, um, tell me what you like or tell me about a book you've read and enjoyed. All of those are open-ended questions. And one of the things that I think we can, a point that we can make to staff is that there really is a lot of similarity between reference work and reader's advisory work. Mm -hmm. That a lot of those skills that you use to be effective at reference also transfer over very well into the reader's advisory context, especially when you need to use a resource uh, to supplement book knowledge. And let's keep in mind that the reader is generally looking for a personal connection to us mm -hmm. and to our expertise to help them find more books to read, whether we are the source of those books or the tools and resources that we use are the sources of those books. That's a great point. And building on that, um, for both of you, um, Tom and Tammy, how do you all effectively communicate to patrons that hey, we're here, we're staff, we know something about books. Are there ways that you do it either um, by passive reader's advisory or just ways that you choose to um, share your, your staff's book knowledge? Mm. Well, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm out in the community a lot, so I'm always at um, civic events and, and so people feel comfortable approaching me, but um, I find just uh, making small talk with, with people just in the building. It's like, oh, you know, and look at this, this just came in, or look at this, isn't this, isn't this a great cover, and then just starting the conversation um, that way. But that's, uh, it, is, it can be tough sometimes, but um, um, you just got to get out there and try, make an effort. How about you, Tammy? Um, I think it just has so many different ways. I mean, it's, it's just not one, you know, path, um, you know, a good portion of the direction that the the district is going is really this hospitality piece and, and this personalized experience, the premium experience. Um, and that is really built on relationships. So we spend a lot of time developing relationships with our, our users, um, our community, our people when we're out in the parks um, at different uh, different uh, events. Um, we we talk books, <laughs> we talk reading, we talk value. We you know that old readers advisory you know that lo reading has intrinsic value. I think it just becomes part of of the conversations we have, and and it, it's how we you you know start um, developing those relationships with our users. 
And so um, I, I think that's why so everybody, not, you know, a good portion of your, uh, your staff needs to uh, be pretty competent at this piece because the person who comes in is looking for that person they have the relationship with. Not right. necessarily right. the one that um, is is really um, a great reader's advisory librarian. So all those pieces uh, is really uh, the comfort level uh, and what kind of, of of relationship. It really comes down to the relationship. Uh, and if for the new person who doesn't you know know anybody in the library, a good portion of our roving and doing that is to start that conversation to develop a new relationship. So. And a lot of times it's around books and reading and, and, and those activities. And you mentioned, um, not to interrupt you, but you mentioned um, during the, the warm-up to the webinar that you often start the morning by having your staff has a discussion about books. And you also mentioned being a part of, a, or sometimes that um, patrons can actually be a part of a conversation between librarians, maybe kind of while they're out in the stacks. And I thought of that again because I've seen some comments come in through the chat about folks kind of that stealthy, you know, we're not really um, stalking the patrons, we're just there doing our work, and it either is offers them an opportunity to start a dialogue because they see you, but also, um, as Tammy had mentioned in the, the pre-webinar warm-up, that staff actually just having a conversation about books in amongst themselves to serve as sort of a catalyst for patrons to kind of um, ask them or, or either get a suggestion that way too. Yeah, and Kathy, um, I was out in um, Telluride uh, a couple of years ago and it was in their public library. And one of the things that they did that I thought was really clever is in the stacks themselves, they had little signs that said, we really want to help you find your next book, ask us for help at the reference desk. Yeah. Um, and I thought browsers are the people who are not likely to know about that service, and to put it where the browsers were was great. Yeah, oh, yeah. and That's also excellent. I've seen similar signs um, inviting folks to check out the books on display so that they know that, oh, this display isn't just pretty, it's actually functional, and you can take all these books. <laughs> and by the way, we hope you do take all those books. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to switch gears just a little bit. There was a question involving training and what kind of um, resources you all recommend um, for some more in-depth genre training for folks on staff so that they'll feel more comfortable. And Duncan, you were talking about building on different staff knowledge and what we can do with that. So anybody have suggestions as far as that goes? Well, and to go back to, to follow up with that, um, you know, Kathy, I mean, one of the things that I think is really important, again, is to find out who those uh, genre experts are on your staff. And they may, as, as, as both Tammy and Tom have pointed out, they may not be your, um, your reference librarians or your professional librarians, not necessarily depending on what the topic is. Uh, another thing that um, you can uh, do is um, also draw on volunteers or members of the community, those high engagement readers that I talked about earlier, having them come in to do a talk uh, or a session um, on areas that are particularly challenging is another great idea. And of course, you can always do uh, what we've done here at Novelist and what many libraries do is, is uh, in an area that you really want to build expertise and capacity in, have a, uh, a genre workshop and put some staff members in charge of researching it and doing the um, presentation. You know, we, we did one here uh, about a year ago, I guess, on science fiction, and we turned it into a science fair project where different um, subgenres had different little science fair um, displays. Great. And also, um, there was a, a comment in the chat earlier about um, folks wanting to point out um, not only knowledge, but just also specialty areas, but not having necessarily room at their library to do that. So mm -hmm. in addition to what Duncan was saying about um, display signage, also shelf talkers to really highlight different areas of the collection and also give your staff kind of a, a way to kind of tune into some, some good titles for folks maybe who aren't quite as comfortable with recommending titles. Um, but what other sources, Tom and Tammy, do you, do you know mm -hmm. of in terms of uh, getting everybody up to speed on their particular genre area of pain. <laughs> well, that is always the challenge. Um, 
Again, there are, there are lots of um, newsletters and stuff available. Um, of course, getting people to sign up is one thing. Getting people to actually read the newsletters is another. Um, but um, just uh, encouraging them, and we we do, of course, with uh, my reference librarians and myself, we do um, uh, do a lot of these you know, little spot training things at the different branches when they have in their staff meetings. We can do an, a little short um, presentation about a specific genre or a specific tool that they can use to get more information. Yeah, does, that, does that help? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about for you, Tammy? I think from, uh, it's all about that sharing piece uh, for us. There, we all, um, you know, uh, I follow a few blogs. Um, other people follow others. Um, I, things pop into my email all the time. Um, you know, I, I subscribe to several different um, newsletters, that kind of thing. And as things come up that are interesting and and you know, we can't all read every you know blog, every <laughs> every every posting of different you know that is out there that you know really pertains to RA. I think we just share what we know, um, and people t get their natural kind of read about their natural kind of interests, and then they share them. And we all benefit from it. Uh, so I I think it's it's really about creating that that environment that just is just every day is about. Uh, we have a, a one a woman who's on staff here at my, at the library I work at, and she routinely talks to publishers. She routinely talks to um, authors. Um, you know. Uh, and she just shares, you know, well, these two people are friends and they, they, are, they admire each other's work. I don't know why that's, you know, important, except I've used that, you know, a couple times in conversation. <laughs> when you're making connections between authors, making connections between uh, 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 different uh, genres, you know, talking about the trends when, when um, you know, it's always interesting when, uh, you know, uh, when publishers start, t t in, you know, using girl in, in similar titles. And the girl, you know, and you start mm -hmm. naming all the girl titles, and um, it, you see the trends, and it's it's a fascinating um, selling piece. And it just is interesting for you to share that knowledge with somebody who's not in the book business, who just uh, feels like they're... They, they, they learn something, you know, and now it all makes sense. <laughs> right, and I think there, there were some comments in the chat about folks who work um, and rely upon volunteers, mm -hmm. and any kind of shelf talkers are great, absolutely fabulous way for volunteers to really share their book knowledge, and also um, anybody on staff who's a strong reader can definitely, earn, and patrons as well, it kind of um, is something easy to do that really invites participation by, by a lot of folks, I think. Yeah. So I'm looking at other questions, and it looks like someone was asking whether anybody has thoughts about a method for Twitter Reader's Advisory. So mm. are you, Tom or Tammy, having success with Twitter Reader's Advisory? Uh, all we've done here is uh, we will, like, um Post a, a you know a flyer or something or a, um, a, a read alike thing to to Twitter. That's about um, the extent we've had here, but uh, that's something we can certainly look into. It's you know all avenues are open, but um, just uh, yeah, try it, see how it goes. We we do have a social media. Um, uh, a person out of the marketing department that you know puts uh, you know throws out uh, Twitter um, pieces, um, but mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure I, I don't have how successful or 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 um, effective that is. Uh, I don't actually follow it too much because it's another um, <laughs> one more uh, social media piece that I I can only. <laughs> Keep in touch in touch right. with so much, uh, but I think reaching people where they're at, uh, yeah. we found that Facebook works really well here. Um, but um, uh, the, uh, the social media librarian does throw out t Twitter feeds all the time. So yeah, and our, our Twitter feed goes into our, yeah. yeah. Our Twitter feed goes into our Facebook account too. So yeah, we catch them that way as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. I know um, in Novelist, um, some of us participate in the Ask a Librarian 
Mm -hmm. um, does anybody, uh, anybody at your libraries participate in that as well? Right. Yes, Someone from our team did. just posted the hashtag and the um, mm -hmm. information about it in the chat in case folks would like to know more about that or take part in it. Yeah, definitely. Great. So I'm still looking. Any other questions that anybody has for, um, for our panel? Would like to take them. I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot of great suggestions in the chat feed. I'll yeah. Have to get a chance to look at that later. Great. We're getting close to um, to time, so let me just um, reiterate that. Lori, if you don't mind showing. Oh, someone just asked a question about audiobooks. That's just something we mm -hmm. haven't even talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the question is audiobooks for summer road trips are tricky. How can we reach those readers? Mm. That's one thing I might throw out too. Mm. <laughs> well, we're we're fortunate to have um, a, a librarian on staff who's like completely in the know about audiobooks, <laughs> and we're starting an audiobook book discussion, and um, and we're looking to do that in the new year. Um, and so there's. And I, I shared that one statistic uh, for our district that the um, the average person has almost a 30-minute travel. So our our audio books um, really fly off off the shelves, um, both electronic versions and then the the um, playaways and um, and uh, audio uh, CDs. So we we're always trying to find that nice balance between collections, but we have a huge uh, readership of audiobooks, um, and uh, we we, we kind of do it the same way we do um, a uh, book RA. It's it's not uh, that different for us, right? And it's also um, hearkening back to what you said earlier, what you just mentioned, and what you said initially about your community, but also what Duncan was um, mentioning in terms of um, making sure you know your readers and know what they're interested in, and just kind of um, staying tuned into that and once again, another opportunity. Cause we, mm -hmm. I wondered if folks interfile their audiobooks with uh, with print print titles as well. Do you guys um, interchange the filing of those? Uh, we we do interfile, especially in the in the children's and teen area. On the adult side, we um, keep them separate because people just you know those commuters want just the audio, <laughs> so we don't right, do it there. Right. But um, teen and, and kids, we do interfile. Yeah. Great. Uh, we we don't um, we don't we keep it separate. We have a a very specific uh, uh, audio uh, popular you know user clientele, and, right. and they don't want to browse that much of a collection. Uh, even if we pull out for displays and that kind of thing, that that's a huge collection that would right. be you know for them. We did just interfile our playaways and our CDs, and that in itself was quite a leap for for some of our users. So, <laughs> you know, they just wanted playaways. So, um, I, we felt that you know there was enough that went back and forth that we didn't really care which um, which format it is. They just wanted it in that audio form, but there was enough that just wanted that cert that one um, format. So. Um, you know, I don't think we're we'll probably be interfiling those anytime. But we, you know, if we we've done that with our nonfiction um, movies, there there's that's a whole different uh, beast at our library. Sure. Well, it looks like um, it's three o'clock, and mm -hmm. I want to thank thank everyone for coming and joining in on the conversation via chat. And special thank you and shout out to our presenters. We've um, you can see that we've posted contact information and. Um, would happily answer any questions about um, more details about the things that were discussed today. And just so you know, in terms of housekeeping, we'll post a recording from this webinar, and we've posted slides and additional articles that we think that you'll find fascinating. And we also um, will be happy to provide a certificate of t attendance for those um, who came. So thanks very much. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you, Tom and Tammy. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yes.